Hello. This is Mike Corrali with the International Political Economy course online, and I am here today to talk about the mercantilist perspective. Realism. The mercantilist perspective is chapter three in your textbook, Introduction to International Political Economy, 7th edition, by David Balam and Bradford Dillman. All citations for articles in this course can be found in the notes on the Canvas website through which this course is being offered. Beginning with Chapter 3, we find Balam takes great pains in defining mercantilism, both its history and its philosophy. Balam touches on mercantilism and colonialism and cites Vladimir Lenin's wonderful book outlining how capitalism and mercantilism are inherently imperialistic. Now, whether you agree with Lenin or not, his arguments are actually very cogent, and it would be lovely to, to further that conversation perhaps in a future lecture. The economic liberal challenges presented in mercantilism are also found in Chapter 1, and he talks about the development of Keynes, the Great Depression, and the post-war order. Balam takes great pains to talk about the entrenchment of neo-mercantilism in the 1970s and the 1980s, and talks about neoliberalism, neo-mercantilism, and the globalization campaign. One of the caveats that I have with Balam's book, although it's, it's an excellent book, is that he tends to be, um, <laughs> you'll forgive me for being frank, he tends to be a Trump basher, and I think you've probably noticed that already. Um, in some of his conclusions, especially, he takes he takes great umbrage at, at President Trump's administration. You know, very clearly, I am neither pro or con um, the Trump administration in this course. As an instructor, I have no political opinion. That's not my job. My job is to inform you about the natures of these economic policies and their impact on the international political economy. Whether you agree with President Trump or disagree with President Trump is your opinion. And my job is to make sure that your opinion is based on good, solid content understanding. In other words, you appreciate, you know, the content of mercantilism, of capitalism, and of President Trump's administration's um, work uh, on behalf of the American economy for good or ill, again, really, but looking at them objectively. And that, if we've done that, we've done our job well. So that being said, I want to take what we learned from Balaam in Chapter 3 and take it up to the next step, to take that information and apply it right to real-world application. All right, so our seminar question you'll see is to examine mercantilism focusing on contemporary U.S. trade policy. And so, naturally, this is President Trump's and the U.S. Congress's trade policy right now. Had this course been offered four years ago, I would have asked you to do the same thing with President Obama or President Clinton or President Reagan. But since we are currently in the Trump administration, Looking at contemporary U.S. trade policy, then, is to focus on President Trump. All right. So we'll come back to the seminar question at the end of our lecture and flesh it out a little bit, as we have in the past and as we have in the future, or we will in the future. So really, my friends, you just you, you, you get that mercantilism is realism. It's about state power. It's about the state using the economy to further the purposes of the state. And so capitalism, right, the free flow of competitive, um, or the free flow of competition in and amongst individuals within, let's say, a democracy is one political, is one political economic expressed ideology. Mercantilism is really quite different. It uses the power of the state in the economy to further the goals of the state. 
Realism, according to our book, suggests that the world is cruel and that the states are the important actors because the states are the rational actors. Their main goal is security and the continuance of the state. In classic realism, as Balan points out, they felt that human nature is bad, that people are inherently greedy, deceitful, and selfish. Hobbes touches on this in his book, The Leviathan, and we talk about it a lot in political ideology as the, the basis for understanding the purpose of government um, in, in the political sense. In neorealism, it is argued that there are no world police. There is no world government. And so really, this system is by nature anarchic. There is no authority. So how do we, as a nation then, get along on our own in this anarchic world that we live in? Realism suggests that security is obtained through strength and power. Power, it is argued, can be spent or saved, can be piled up or depleted, depending on the prioritization of the state and the state's purposes. So remember that realists think in relative terms, absolute versus relative gains, that any changes to the status quo is a zero-sum game. There are winners and there are losers. And so the purpose in a mercantilism, in a mercantilist system for the state is to improve one's own position, to allow it to win allow it to effectively compete amongst other nations. Realists tend to be cautious about efforts to change the international system. They don't think the system can change. Remember, if realists believe that people are greedy, deceitful, and selfish, that um, states are the rational actors, and that there is no world police, well, then realists sincerely believe that the ends justify the means whatever it takes to get and maintain power, control, and resources for the nation is okay. And this is really at the heart of mercantilism and realism, and it's what we're after today. Turning then to our PowerPoint slides, we, we get a, a little more uh, in-depth view, bouncing off Balaam and bouncing off what we had established in our first international political economy lecture, Introduction to IPE, I would suggest that mercantilism, the first real theory of international trade, is an economic concept for the purpose of building a wealthy and powerful state, which believes that the wealth of a nation can only be achieved through government controls and regulation of trade, commerce, and economic activities. It involves wealth accumulation, establishment of favorable trade with other countries, and development of internal resources in the manufacturing and agricultural sectors. The economic policies that are pursued by the mercantilists, such as government, governmental control of the use and exchange of precious metals, is also often referred to as bullionism. Bullion is another term for gold in its um, accumulated sense, and so bullionism speaks to the control of the government over precious metals, bullionism. Adam Smith coined the term mercantile system to describe the system of political economy that sought to enrich the country by restraining imports and encouraging exports. This system dominated Western European economic thought and policies, including Portugal, France, Spain, Great Britain, from the 16th to the late 18th centuries. So remember, we always have to back that up. The 16th century is talking about the 1500s. The 18th century is talking about the 1700s. So we're talking about the, the system that dominated Western European economic thought from the 1500s through the 1700s. Its use was favored by writers such as Jean-Patrice Colbert, who at that time served as the French finance minister. Again, the basic concepts of mercantilism in terms of trading are that this approach assumes 
the wealth of the nation depends primarily on the possession of precious metals such as gold and silver. Gold and silver were the currency of trade between these countries. So by exporting goods, countries could earn gold and silver and therefore maximize the amount of gold and silver they held within their borders and that represented security because money is power. Money can be turned into arms. Money can be turned into um, influence. And so by gathering and coalescing gold and silver within your borders, you're making your country stronger. So by exporting goods, countries earn and therefore minimize, maximize the amount of gold and silver they have. So conversely then, importing goods from other countries resulted in an outflow of good gold and silver to those countries and in a mercantilist idea then that is bad <laughs> so the basic concept of mercantilism in terms of trading is to make sure that the country's own resources are exported to other countries in higher volumes or amounts compared to the goods imported which are kept to a minimum level trading is said to be balanced if a country exports more than it imports through this system, resources will increase and there will be a surplus of gold and silver reserves. In the words of the English mercantilist writer Thomas Munn, quote, The ordinary means, therefore, to increase our wealth and treasure is by foreign trade, wherein we must ever observe this rule to sell more to strangers yearly than we consume of theirs in value, close quote. This theory suggests that the government should play an active role in the economy by encouraging exports and discouraging imports, especially through the use of tariffs. So, the features of a mercantilist economy include import prohibition of certain goods using imposition of high tariffs, government legislation, or very high taxes or import duties. Secondly, a wide range of government subsidies on export industries to promote the country's export-based policy. Then we'll have policies of nationalism writ large, and we'll talk about that in a few slides forward. Fourth, we have the accumulation of assets in gold and silver, and the prohibition of private accumulation of gold and silver or use or export of these items, that then it would be illegal to export gold and silver from the country by a private individual. It assumes a one-way trade with colonies. In other words, if, a, if what they call a metropolitan or the colonial power has a colony, then importing gold and raw materials from those colonies, manufacturing in the domestic economy, and exporting then the manufactured goods back to the colonies, a captive market, then this creates a mercantilist economy whereby the metropolitan country, the colonial power, benefits. Mercantilist policies have included high tariffs, especially on manufactured goods to protect domestic manufacturing, exclusive trade with colonies, check, and this is Vladimir Lenin and his, his um, idea that um, Mercantilism and capitalism is inherently imperialistic and colonial. Forbidding trade to be carried in foreign ships, because if the foreign ships are carrying your goods, then the foreign countries are making money. So you want to trade in your own ships. You want um, to provide for export subsidies. So again, taking governmental money to helping subsidize the manufacture of goods that are intended to be exported promotes exporting and exporting promotes bringing gold in, and so is inherent in mercantilism. Again, banning all export of gold and silver, either by the government or by individuals. Promoting manufacturing with research or direct subsidies. Limiting wages, right, to keep our exports then more competitive with foreign uh, goods. And maximizing the use of domestic resources. So. Mercantilism in a nutshell. With economic nationalism, you have to command the house. Colbert, who I spoke about before, conceived this economic nationalism, this economic model to support um, the government during the reign of Louis XIV, to support Louis XIV, the French king's absolute monarchy. 
Mercantilism creates a command economy in a nationalist or populist political environment through subsidies, monopolies, and protective tariffs. Again, imports threaten domestic manufacturing, so exports good, imports bad. Mercantilism then lacks the economic efficiency of laissez-faire, or the capitalist model that we talked about in the prior lecture and in our introductory lecture. Mercantilism supports self-sufficiency and a favorable balance of trade. Remember, that means more exports than imports. Again, mercantilism politically is a zero-sum game. In other words, you either win or you lose in mercantilism. In classic liberalism, and as we'll see as we go further, this is what this course is all about, this idea of free trade among countries is actually win-win. Mercantilism sees it as win-lose, zero-sum game. Again, going back to Lenin, Balam talks about this. We're going to talk about it again when we get to structuralism. Colonialism serves mercantilism well. It expands the market and access to natural resources. We're going to talk about structuralism, but also if you're, if you're familiar with American history and the American colonial experience leading to the American Revolution, England being mercantilist, trying to create a um, captive market in the colonies through taxes or through monopolies that resulted in, for example, the Boston Tea Party. This is exactly what we're talking about. That was mercantilism at its best. And remember that mercantilism is a team sport. So it sees the state as having preeminence over the individual. Laissez-faire, capitalism, is an individual sport. It is the rational individual who is making choices, and so that drives the economy. So we hearken back then to Adam Smith and his book, The Wealth of Nations, that you're so familiar with now, both through Balaam's book and through my previous lectures. Adam Smith refuted the idea that the wealth of a nation is measured by the size of its treasury, and it considered this, this the foundational element of modern economic thought. He refuted then the idea that the more gold you have, the better off you are. In fact, I love this, this idea because what he says is the, the measure of wealth, actually the money you have, or the ability to produce it. Do you want to build a reserve of gold that can be depleted, or do you want to build the ability to manufacture, the ability to produce, that is an ongoing gift to the nation, it's an ongoing source of revenue, right? And so if you, if you devote your attention then to, to developing the ability to produce, that, he says, is the wealth of nations, and that is at the heart of capitalism compared to contrasting mercantilism. Adam Smith argued that trade, when freely initiated, benefits both parties. He argued that specialization in production allows for economies of scale, which improves both growth and efficiency. And so Balan talks about this in, in his book, but Adam Smith also talks about it. In the English perspective, then, they tried in the, in the 15, 16, 1700s to grow wine. If you've ever been to England, you get that the climate is not suited to growing wine grapes. It's just not there, right? And so for England, then, to, to try desperately to grow wine was rather spinning their wheels. They couldn't do it efficiently. They couldn't do it effectively or economically. But what they could do is provide textiles. We talked about this in a previous lecture, and they did. And then some. They were a huge textile manufacturer. So then if Portugal, let's say, and Balaam says, can create really delicious wine economically because the soil and the climate lend itself to wine production, then that wine can produce, be produced a lot less expensively. And so then what harm is it then to take the Portuguese wine that they produce so economically and trade it with English textiles that England can produce economically? It's a win-win situation. That's what Adam Smith and his Wealth of Nations is making his counterpoint to mercantilism. Finally, he argued that collusive relationships between government and industry were harmful to society. And so if government is subsidizing an export industry, let's say, oh, I don't know, agriculture. If government then is going to support and subsidize agricultural industry in a country, 
then that industry is going to be tied into government. And how it produces is going to be more driven to governmental regulations than the market economy and free trade in supply and demand, right? And so Adam Smith's counterpoints to mercantilism are actually very well stated and, and very adroit. So now we take a break and we look then to the U.S. policy process. So we're looking at mercantilism and the question is, does the current administration's trade policies reflect mercantilism? Okay, so that's what we're after in this lecture. So then looking at the U.S. policy process will help us determine at what insertion points in the conversation, in the policymaking process, might mercantilism or mercantilist ideas be found. So the U.S. policy process is really a lot like, you'll forgive the expression, making sausage. It's, you love sausage, you like to eat it, but you don't want it seeing you don't want to see it being made. It's a dreadful thing. Well, the same is true here with the U.S. policy process. Why? There are so many different players and so many points of insertion for interest. You have Congress and the congressional subcommittees that we're going to be talking about in a few slides. You have special interests. You have the constituents. Um, you have the whiners. <laughs> I use this to get your attention. A little bit of humor goes a long way, right? But the people who are so interested in the electorate, in the policy, whatever it may be, in, you know, in agriculture, um, in um, communications, in, in software, in infrastructure, there's always going to be some part of the electorate that is going to be very interested beyond the special interest groups, beyond the um, lobbying groups, um, in this in this process, and finally, you have the academics. You know, academics uh, people who um, write and read and teach uh, about economic policy are often called upon to provide input and perspective in the policy process itself. So, we have to understand the process if you want to see how the policy is being influenced or if it is inherently mercantilist. And so information is good to a point. Um, it's always good to be able to read about the policy process and to understand it, but in order to really get into it, you have to understand who the players are. Well, to get at that question, we have to look at critical policy questions. For example, what is the policy under question? What are the facts? What are the observations of the policy and the need for the policy? And so if we're talking about agricultural subsidies, then um, what are the facts of the agricultural, the state of agriculture in the United States in 2020? What are uh, the relevant observations? Then we have to ask ourselves, what should be? What are the value judgments? Often this is normative. In other words, it's a subjective view of what is value, what should be. What should be the government subsidies for agriculture? What should not be and why? But then you have to also ask yourself, what can be? What are the politics? Can it be done? If you're talking about increasing um, subsidies or decreasing subsidies for any manufacturing, any domestic manufacturing or agricultural product, what are the politics behind it? Can it actually be done? And so then what will be? Understanding what is, what should be, what can be, what will be? Well, this takes us to what they call the economic theory of public choice. And so the economic theory of public choice divides the conversation into private choices and public choices. In private choices, we have three key principles. All resources are scarce or limited. Limited may be very vast, but still limited. In other words, they're not infinite. There is a limited amount of oil in the world. There is a limited amount of fresh water in the world. There is a little limited amount of arable land to grow crops in the United States. There are limits to the resources. Private choices assumes rational behavior, that you want to make decisions rationally and logically. Well, this assumption um, <laughs> often doesn't actually revolve around the choice or the issue at hand. The rational behavior might be to make money or to further the chances of re-election in a, in a partisan contest or to, to keep your constituents happy so that you can achieve re-election personally. You get the idea. It assumes rational behavior, but rational behavior, as I'm going to suggest, isn't always tied to the actual 
public choice or the question at hand. Prices often signal consumption and production decisions. So this is the supply and demand mechanism that we're so used to talking about with economics. Now, there are also public choices. So the key principles of all resources are scarce or limited and assuming rational behavior are also extant in public choices. But then we also have trade-offs. So if we're talking about the public as a whole, if we're talking about subsidizing, um, let's say, agriculture, then there is a trade-off because if there's only so much money, resource, you, you, you understand that the, the budget, especially at the national level, has to fit within a certain parameter. And so if you're going to subsidize agricultural output, then something else has to give. Right? On an issue-by-issue -issue basis, if you're going to spend more money to subsidize agriculture, perhaps you're going to spend less money on infrastructure or less money on defense. Or if you spend more money on defense, perhaps you'll have less money to spend on education. Again, you know, I've argued many times that I am, am nonpartisan, but having looked at the national debt today where it stands as where it stood 20 years ago, and so I'm not just picking on President Trump, but President Obama, President Bush, I remember, now I'm an old guy, but I remember when our national debt topped $3 trillion, I was very concerned for the country. I was very concerned for the nation to have that kind of a national debt seemed astronomical three trillion well as you know we're we're capping now about 27 trillion <laughs> so when i say there's only so much money <clears throat> i don't know maybe there's not maybe we can just keep printing it <sighs> so forgive me a little a little digression but we look at values then and so what are the values then they're going to to um, be involved in this policy decision in this public choice decision. What are the values of the country? What do we feel, you know, going back again to agricultural subsidies, what do we feel about agriculture? Well, I would argue that Jeffersonian agri um, agrarian values are still extant. So these are the values that Thomas Jefferson imbued. He saw an agrarian republic. His model was a yeoman farmer behind his plow with a book of Cicero in his hand. Now that'd be kind of hard to pull off, but you get the idea, right? Where you have um, somebody who is very connected to the soil, who is very interested in an agrarian way of life, a rural um, crop producing farming way of life. And you have the sum total of the nation, this agrarian nation, whereby you have um, intelligent, well-read, well-reasoning yeoman farmers as the, the basis for the republic. This is the Jeffersonian agrarian value that was um, evident in, in the founding and when he took office in 1800, um, imbued legislation and uh, values at that time as well. And so he argued that agriculture is the basic occupation of mankind, that rural life is morally superior su that rural life is morally superior to urban life. We'll come back to this, especially when we talk about the Electoral College and how the Electoral College is skewed to benefit rural states. Now, you need only ask Hillary Clinton, who won the popular vote, or Al Gore in 2000, who won the popular vote, but lost the Electoral College to understand how the Electoral College as an institutional mechanism is intended to give greater weight to rural states at the expense of the urban centers. This was a Jeffersonian value. It was a Jeffersonian calculation. Now, Jefferson wasn't at the Constitutional Convention. Jefferson didn't participate in the Committee of Eleven that came up with the Electoral College. Jefferson was in France as our ambassador to France at the time. So you can't blame that on Jefferson, but the idea of the agrarian values extant in the Electoral College that Jefferson so finely articulates is proof that this was widely spread and the founding fathers in the Constitutional Convention actually inculcated that ideal rural life is morally superior to urban life in the Constitution. Jefferson saw this as a nation of small independent farmers and it was the proper basis for a democratic society for this republic. Well, our question is, are these values still true? Can they be proven? And how do we still hold these values? And so we come to the question of myth. 
Now, a myth in our current understanding, in our current use of the word, denotes a falsehood. That, that's a myth. That's not correct. A myth isn't true or false, I would argue, in its, in its true definition. A myth is a story about ourselves, in and amongst ourselves, that we hold for ourselves. Well, again, whether it's true or not is neither here nor there. It is what we hold to be part of our our zeitgeist, part of our culture. And so some agrarian myths that are coming down include that economic prosperity depends on agricultural prosperity. Okay, And you probably feel that, right? That we have to have farmers, we have to have farms, we have to be able to produce our own agriculture for our national security. I get that. I get that. And I'm not arguing that it's true or false. I'm saying that this is a myth, this is a story, this is an understanding that we amongst ourselves hold collectively. Okay. It also holds that the rural community well-being depends on farmer well-being, that land is the source of all wealth, that farm programs are good food programs, that farmers are inherently environmentalists because they want to see the land succeed, they want to see the land produce as long and as best as possible, and that all tariffs are equal. Well, what do you think? Can a myth be true? Can it be a lie? Myths are simply popular. They are what people want to hear, and they become part of the policy rhetoric. And they don't have to be true, then, to affect policy. Because if the electorate or if the um, body politic agree that a myth, a story that we tell ourselves, like land is the source of all wealth, is true, then anything we need to do to protect the land or to further our agricultural output, like farm subsidies, is good. There is also an aspect of the politics of the minority. Now, if you're in a minority, you'll know that there are several tactics in our political system that will effectively increase the influence of a minority in the policy-making process. One of the first tactics, then, is to find allies issue by issue. Allies will sometimes agree on a specific issue, but not generally on a philosophy-by-philosophy -philosophy basis. In other words, you may have allies like labor unions, who will agree on an issue like minimum wage, but not necessarily agree philosophically on other issues, other topics. And so by building coalitions among allies on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, we're able to establish coalitions, compromises, and find common ground. When you have allies coming together, you create a greater number, and the voice of the minority and its effect on the politics and the policy-making process becomes more effective. The minority will need to be positive, reasonable, and work within the system in order to achieve success. They can base their case on facts, but not necessarily on myths or emotions. And they need to adopt a nonpartisan strategy. In other words, not just Republican or Democrat, but a broader nonpartisan strategy. So you'll find that I keep yammering about agricultural policy because I think the 2018 Farm Bill that just came through, you'll find an increase in U.S. government's farm subsidies that is remarkable. And it is tied directly to President Trump's trade war with China specifically, but also with Japan and in Europe, on U.S. agricultural exports and imports. That is what the Farm Bill is, achieve, is meant to achieve. And so when you look at the power in the agricultural food and policy menu, or the process then, who are the big players? Well, first you have the government, right, with the executive branch and the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. So we know the executive branch executes the law that's created by the legislative branch. And then the judicial branch reviews the law as cases come up from those affected and determines their constitutionality or not. So government is the first tier of power in the agricultural and food policy process. But 
There are other organizations that are as participatory, that are as effective and as influential in the policymaking process. These include general farm organizations, commodity organizations, agribusiness, and other public interest groups. So we'll dive into that, but I wanted to touch on the agricultural iron triangle. So we touched on the iron triangle in the introduction to capitalism and uh, the introduction to international political economy lectures, both. You'll remember that the iron triangle is the unbreakable relationship between interest groups, the legislative branch, and the bureaucracy. And so in this instance, then, you have the legislative branch. If you look at the House, the lower chamber, house.gov, if you go to their menu, to their committees, you'll find the Agricultural Committee. The Agricultural Committee of the House of Representatives represents the legislative branch in the Iron Triangle. Then you also have the um, USDA, which is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so if you go to USDA.gov, under Menu to Topics, and then under Topics to Trade, and when you have, then you'll see supporting exports, marketing and trade assistance programs. The USDA, as the bureaucratic element in the Iron Triangle, speaks directly to agriculture and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's job to increase marketing and trade assistance programs, support exports, and provide information to agricultural interest groups. And you can also go to www.ree.usda.gov for further information. So that is the legislative branch and the bureaucratic branch, the USDA, the Secretary of Agriculture. Then you have the interest groups. And I, I rattled off a number of them, but let me go into a little further detail. You have farm organizations, and farm organizations are generally farm or agribusiness organizations such as the American Farm Bureau Federation or the National Farmers Union. You also have commodity organizations such as the National Corn Growers, the National Cotton Council, um, and you'll find that every commodity has one, and some have multiple commodity organizations. All other things being equal, the more specific the case or the interest, the more effective the group, the more honed in, the more laser-like focus they have on corn or on cotton or on tobacco, then all other things being equal, the more effective they'll be. You also have commodity organizations. They're the most effective organizations in agriculture because of their focus on commodity interests. As I said, that laser-like focus. So commodity organizations are most effective, and those that represent an industry, such as the National Cotton Council, the NCC, is a good example. And so beef had other conflicts, for example, among cattlemen and cattle feeders, the NCBA, which proves that these commodity organizations in and amongst themselves are often at odds. If a producer organization goes head-to-head -head with agribusiness, agribusiness normally wins. Um, it is more powerful by virtue of its um, ability to build coalitions and it, the resources that are available to it for lobbying. Almost always you'll find that there are state related organizations, in other words, not only at the federal level, but at the state level, um, these organizations are lobbying for um, positive legislation and positive enactment through the state bureaucracies. And party alignment is often an interesting issue. I had argued that the most effective are nonpartisan, but sometimes being partisan or aligning to a party can actually serve your cause, whether that be Republican or Democrat. Agribusiness trade organizations could include such things as, you know, the restaurant associations, equipment dealers, chemical applicators, um, international dairy foods association. So this is agribusiness or trade that is around agriculture. They're not obviously out in the fields, but restaurant associations have a very definite interest in the positive agricultural commodity. In other words, they want to see agriculture improve because their their source of commodity will be tied into the effectiveness and the success of agribusiness. So going into our policy process, first we have to differentiate public policy, domestic policy, and foreign policy. 
So public policy, by definition, are all government programs and regulations, right? So you're talking about that iron triangle. You're talking about the legislative process and creating legislation and the bureaucracy implementing that legislation. Any policy, any program, any regulation that touches the public is inherently public policy. Now, you can take public policy and further slice and dice it between domestic policy and foreign policy. And so domestic policy is government programs and regulations that directly affect residents of a country. And so you can have public policy that are going to uh, be government programs or regulations that are inherently meant to affect the residents of the country, the domestic population. So when we say the United States, we're talking about the, the people within the United States. Foreign policy is also a public policy, but it addresses the conduct of relations between nations. So when you look at subsidizing agriculture and you look at um, tariffs on imports coming in, what you're looking at is the conduct the conduct of relations between the nations as foreign policy. Now, we understand, too, that there is a policy-making process. And very quickly, and we'll go into these in more detail, it will start with a setting the agenda, deliberating, enactment, implementation, output, and outcome, going back to agenda setting. So first and foremost, the policy-making process, stage one, agenda setting. The process of making an issue visible enough that political leaders take it seriously. And this is uh, one of the jobs of lobbying. When you go to looking at lobbying and the effects of special interests in the U.S. political system, setting the agenda is one of the main purposes of interest groups and lobbies in our political system. It's a good thing because they're ostensibly providing the voice of a collective, whether that collective is corporate um, or the public at large lobbying groups helping set the public agenda to get political leaders to take something seriously is part of their job. So agenda setting. Second, deliberation. So debate and discussion over the issues placed on the policy agenda. And this is, again, where not only politicians, but interest groups, the public, the media, and policy experts, those darn academic academics that we talked about earlier get into the system as well. So we're going to slice it and dice it and deliberate it and have a grand discussion about this this policy and really get into the weeds and figure out what the policy should be. Now, this is how it works on paper. <laughs> this is how it works in theory. When you really look at the policy making process and the deliberation, what you're looking at is the discussion in and amongst interest groups and the legislatures. Right? Because this is the Iron Triangle. You can invite the public, you can invite the media, you can invite policy experts, but as I'll point out at the end of this lecture, in the most recent agricultural bill, there were limits put into the agricultural bill that went through the policy process, that went through the interest groups, the public, the media, the policy experts. Everybody was very happy that we were going to begin to put limits on the, the agricultural bill and the farm subsidies. But when it got into conference committee, after the cameras were turned off and the media went on to other things, when it got into conference committee, those restrictions, those limitations on subsidies were taken out. And the bill was passed and signed by the president. Again, this policy-making process is true in theory. In practice, it's often a different issue. Policy-making stage three, enactment, where you take the passage of a law by public officials. It's usually accompanied by credit claiming by public officials. Stage four is the actual implementation or the translation of legislation into an actual set of governmental programs or regulations. There is considerable influence, as I suggest, by the bureaucracy and local officials in this implementation stage, again, part of the Iron Triangle. Policy making stage five is the output, the actual provision of services or regulations, in other words, when the rubber meets the road. And as you'll see, uh, the outcome, uh, the effect of the output suggests that the effects of the policy output on individuals and businesses often give rise to new issues, problems with the implementation, problems with the policy. It went too far. It didn't go far enough. Uh, we weren't able to implement this uh, because X, Y, and Z. And so you go back to the drawing board with agenda setting. Again, the stages of policy making, agenda setting, deliberation, enactment, implementation, output, and outcome. And so when you're looking at economic policy, both as a domestic policy and as a foreign policy, what do policymakers want? Low inflation and low unemployment. 
Why? Because with low inflation and low unemployment, the electorate is happy. And the electorate will put you back into office if they find that their, their lives, their economic lives, are stable. Low inflation, low unemployment. They have two tools to achieve this. They, the legislatures, they, the policymakers. And that includes fiscal policy, such as taxing and spending, and monetary policy, as I suggest, the money supply. I joked, <laughs> ostensibly joked earlier when I was talking about the national debt that we could just keep printing money. Well, this is what we're talking about. This is one of the tools that is available, the monetary policy. And we'll get to this when we talk about um, the World Bank in a little bit. So what is U.S. foreign policy? Well, what is foreign policy? Foreign policy is a nation's external international goals and the external techniques used to achieve them. Examples of foreign policy goals and tools, and we'll go through these individually, include diplomacy, economic aid, technical assistance, military intervention, and trade policy. And so diplomacy is the process by which states carry on political relations with other states, settling conflicts among nations by peaceful means. And as we get into the Bretton Woods institutions, like the World Trade Organization and the IMF, the United Nations, it's NATO, etc. Diplomacy then is going to find its home in these institutions. You can also have economic aid as a foreign policy tool, providing assistance to other nations in the form of grants, loans, credits to buy the assisting nation's products. We'll talk about the Marshall Plan again. We touched on it earlier in classic liberalism, and we'll definitely talk about it again when we get to the EU at the end of this semester. But economic aid, then, is a big part of U.S. foreign policy. What about technical assistance? The practice of sending experts and technology in such areas as agriculture, engineering, um, or business as an aid. Of course, there's always military intervention as U.S. foreign policy, the deployment of armed forces inside the border of another nation. And finally, what we're most interested in for our lecture is trade policy. So those regulations and agreements that control imports and exports to foreign countries, trade policy is then one of five main tools to conduct foreign policy, to conduct how we relate to other nations, our nation's external goals and the external techniques we use to achieve them include trade policy, how we control imports and exports in and amongst foreign countries. And so again, just to recap, the foreign policy process are those steps by which the nation's foreign policy goals are decided and acted upon. This includes a national security policy, policy that is concerned specifically with the safety and defense of the nation national security strategy that puts America first. And so I would refer you to the 2017 National Security Strategy, NSS, Pillar 2, Promote American Prosperity, that is readily discoverable on Google. Now, national security policy as a part of foreign policy, especially when it talks about trade or trade policy, I'm thinking TikTok. <laughs> so this is very current, right, where President Trump is talking about um, either denying TikTok the ability to operate within the United States or perhaps creating some kind of a deal whereby they'll pay the United States. We don't know how that's going to look yet. But it is based on the idea of national security because the idea is that TikTok is reaching into American consumers' phones to take information. Like that's never happened before. But there it is. There's the national security component that is going to help drive the U.S. foreign policy of trade issues. Should, can TikTok then operate on American users' phones because of its national security components, ostensibly? There's also a defense policy, which is a subset of national security policy, but they are policies having to do with the U.S. armed forces. Okay, so we get back then to our erstwhile seminar question. Is Trumpism mercantilist. And so going back to our idea of mercantilism, there are winners and losers, right? It's a zero-sum game that the security of the nation and the, the future prosperity of the nation depends on trade and collecting gold, on collecting um, resources, on winning. Now, 
President Trump's rhetoric, his, his expressed language, seems to lead one to believe that he is inherently mercantilist because he's, he's talking about America first. He's talking about make America great again, primarily economically through trade disputes, through what he calls, in his own words, trade wars. And so if we live in a capitalist society and we understand the benefits of capitalism, even when we look at Japan and Germany as examples of capitalism that, that have special unique features, what about the United States under President Trump's administration? Is Trumpism mercantilist? And I don't, I don't use the term Trumpism as a derogatory statement. I use it to describe President Trump's administrative policies and agenda policies as evidenced in his, his own addresses and his own policy statements. So Trumpism isn't mercantilist. Well, historically, mercantilism has surfaced in moments of upheaval when accepted ideas on the relationship between politics and economics are thrown into question. For example, tariffs against the industries of erstwhile American allies have been framed by President Trump as issues of national security. And so tiffs that we've had then with the EU, with Canada, with Mexico, with Japan, with India, with France, I would argue that President Trump has weaponized tariffs for non-economic issues. So you may remember that President Trump threatened Mexico with tariffs to respond to their lack of energy in stopping what he called the waves of refugees coming from, from uh, Central and South America up through Mexico to the United States border. He wanted Mexico to be more active, to be more energetic in stopping the refugees before they got to the border. And in order to do that, in order to put the, the, uh, the pressure on Mexico, he threatened tariffs on commodities. So he weaponized tariffs for issues of national security. Likewise, for France, he um, had issues with French domestic technology rules that he saw as unfair or um, disadvantageous to the United States. And through, so he threatened tariffs on French exports to pressure them into aligning their domestic tech rules with American interests. So tariffs as a tool hearken to mercantilism. We've touched on that. However, one could counter argue that these tariffs aren't intended to promote mercantilism. They're intended to apply political pressure. And so they're being used incorrectly. Now, raw materials are to be bought as cheaply as possible while placing tariffs on finished products to encourage domestic production. That is at the heart of mercantilism. But currently, the U.S. is putting tariffs on steel and aluminum raw materials used to make other products. You can talk about the trade war with China in your seminar question. Is Trumpism mercantilist looking specifically at the elements of the trade war with China? Now, we touched on the trade war with China in a previous essay, in a previous seminar question, but if you want to use it again in this seminar question, you're more than welcome to. The question is, is that trade war inherently mercantilist? Another element of mercantilism in Trumpism is limiting wages. So one of our original definitions of mercantilism is to keep wages low. Because if you keep domestic wages low, you lower the cost of producing commodities. The lower the cost of producing it makes it more competitive on the world stage. If a commodity is more competitive on the world stage, then you have an advantageous export balance, right? If you create a widget less than Mexico or China or Turkey or India, and you can sell that widget abroad, then you're bringing gold and power and authority into the, into the nation, into the United States. So limiting wages has been a cornerstone of Trump administration policy. Tightening qualifications for who must be paid minimum wage was one of those elements, but also who must be paid overtime 
encouraging firms to classify employees as independent contractors, thereby loosening wage protection for tipped workers, um, exempting seasonal workers from federal minimum wage hikes, um, and actually rolling back child labor laws. So you get the idea. Limiting wages is an inherent part of Trumpism and Trump's policy. And the question is, is that inherently mercantilist? Maximizing the use of domestic resources also mercantilist, right? That you want to create as much um, product as you can within the borders of your country. Pure mercantilism. Well, maximizing the use of domestic resources then can be seen through the Trump administration's policies, in this instance their domestic policies, surrounding the Dakota Access Pipeline or the Keystone XL Pipeline and his April 2019 orders that make it easier to build oil and gas pipelines and harder for the states to challenge that. So if you're building pipelines, both oil and gas pipelines, or you're allowing pipelines that have already been built to continue, you're ostensibly maximizing the use of domestic resources, in this instance, energy and oil. And then finally, if you're looking at subsidizing exports, I would argue this case study, what I've kind of been yammering on the whole time, about agriculture. Now, if you really want some great insight into agricultural policy, I would send you to Cato.org. It's C A T O dot org. And it's easily discoverable on Google. And you'll once you get into Cato, there's another search engine where you can find policies or articles on agriculture and agricultural trade and agricultural subsidies. Now, Cato, and I have to give you this heads up, is a conservative organization. They are neoclassical. In other words, they're of the Reagan-Thatcher mindset that we talked about last, last lecture. And so, but bearing that in mind, they're looking at President Trump's policies insofar as agricultural subsidies and asking themselves, is Trumpism mercantilist insofar as agricultural subsidies go? So that's just a jumping off place. I don't mean to, to say that they are the end all um, or the definitive, but they provide some really interesting arguments and perhaps some other sources that you can, that you can access. Now, when doing research, as you know probably better than I, the first part of research is finding out what the question is, right? And so by going to this organization, it may, by reading an article, cause you to ask 10 other questions. Yes, but what about this? What about that? Have you thought of this? And it's those questions then that will further drive your research. Now, my friends, please forgive me for going on, but we remember that this essay is only intended to be three pages, um, plus or minus, minus three pages, double-spaced, to examine mercantilism focusing on contemporary U.S. trade policy. So it's a deep question. There's a lot to be said. There's a lot to be researched. But remember that this essay is really only worth 40 points, which is a big part of your grade. But take a deep breath and do the best you can. Do the best you can. Develop what is mercantilism? What is U.S. trade policy? Looking at trade policy, perhaps I choose agriculture, perhaps I choose TikTok, whatever the case may be, right? And then ask yourself, does Trumpism, does this policy then reflect mercantilism? Yes or no? Your argument may say no. Your argument may argue that this is pure capitalism, Mike. That's great. Please, knock yourself out. Convince me. I'm there. But this is the seminar question. If you were to provide a thesis statement for the seminar question, I would argue that U.S. trade policy seems to exhibit some elements of mercantilism. Okay. Now, this suggests that as paragraph one in your introduction, just like we did last time, paragraph one, your introduction includes your thesis statement. Paragraph two, I would argue, you need to define mercantilism. Don't think that your reader, even though it's just me, don't think that your reader understands what mercantilism is. This is your chance through one paragraph, maybe two paragraphs, to define mercantilism. So you go back to Balaam, you go back to the textbook, you go back to our lecture, you go to these PowerPoint slides, and give your, your reader an idea of what mercantilism is. What is trade policy? Ha, huh, you thought I was going crazy with all that policy process um, conversation. This is your chance to, 
uh, express that. Now, I'm not asking you to parrot. I'm asking you to tell me what is trade policy. You may like my slides. You may like my arguments. Maybe you don't. If you don't, that's fine. You're not required to use them, but you do have to tell me what trade policy is, right? You can't say that Trump is or isn't mercantilistic in trade policy if you don't tell me what trade policy is. That makes sense, right? And then finally, use an example. Again, TikTok, agriculture, you name it. I don't care. What is the policy and is it inherently mercantilistic or not? And to conclude, and, and in concluding, you want to reiterate your thesis statement. You don't have to echo it. You can perhaps retool it say it in another way, another format. The idea is to get your reader to, to read your essay by hearing you say what it is you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them you told them. So what it is you're going to tell them in your thesis statement in your introduction, tell them in the body of your essay, and then your conclusion tells them that you told them. In other words, they reiterate the thesis statement, they reiterate the introduction, Tell them you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them you told them. <laughs> the three the three magic uh, tools for creating a good essay. My friends, that is mercantilism. And I will see you in our next lecture, which has to do with Chapter 4 and structuralism, or the structuralist perspective. We'll be using France as a case study. My friends, have a great week and be well.